people want to get high. People are always looking for a way to use drugs recreationally or not. I think the perception is that if it's sold that openly, it's, it's got to be safe for me, and that's completely false. Hi, uh, my name is Nilu Tabrizi. Welcome to On the Line. Today we're going to be talking about synthetic weed known on, th on the street as K2 and Spice. Um, so I have Ali Conti with me today. She's a staff writer for Vice.com and she's been writing about K2 uh, since July. What's up, Nilu? What's up? Hey, Ali and Nilu. <laughs> Thank you both for coming on the show today. So we've got a bunch of people on the internet who are excited to talk to you and we've got a couple on Skype. So let's get started with our first Skype caller. This is Brady who's calling us from Washington, D.C. Let's say to Brady. Hey, Brady. Hey, what's hey, up? Um, fascinating article. Um, I, I have a question, if, if you would uh, please uh, try your best to make sense of this confusing drug world for me. Um, so I don't know a whole lot about these synthetic drugs. What I do know is that earlier this year, a teenager uh, took a whole bunch of spice, was all kinds of messed up, and he went up to the roof of a parking garage and jumped off to his death. Um, so I'm wondering, what does this drug have in it that makes it associate with marijuana? Why is this a synthetic marijuana? Is it, does it have something that emulates THC or something? Um, because as far as I know, when you smoke marijuana, you don't just jump off of grooves. Um, so, so I'm just wondering, how does that connection make sense? Yeah, you're right. I mean, generally, people don't jump off roofs when they smoke uh, marijuana. So before we answer your question, I'm going to throw to clip number four, please, Michael, and it's just going to talk to you about the composition and what's actually in synthetic weed. The banned cannabinoid in weed is THC. Synthetic cannabis like spice mimics the effects of weed by replicating and slightly altering the chemical that gets people high. Legal high manufacturers design cannabinoids and constantly update the composition of their products so that they remain within the law. But these experiments can leave the user smoking a legal version of weed that can be a hundred times stronger. So yeah, I mean, the biggest danger is that we don't necessarily know what's in every compound. It's a mixed bag. Each batch of K2 and spice is different. But Ali, do you want to maybe go into a little bit more depth about the composition and, and what this actually means? Sure. I guess the, the slightly more te uh, technical answer is that what we call synthetic uh, marijuana it activates the same part of the brain. It's called the CB1 receptor, as THC does, which, as you may know, is the active part of marijuana that gets you high. But uh, it's, it's what's called a, a full agonist as opposed to a partial agonist, which is what THC is. So that means that it's much more powerful and efficient and acting or uh, reacting with that receptor. So it creates like a way, way stronger reaction than THC. Um, and because these are research chemicals that are being kind of put into a spray bottle and then sprayed onto green leafy substances and sold in stores, the potency varies wi uh, wildly. So it's just somebody with a spray bottle doing it. So it's not like the amount isn't regulated in any way. So that's why you can have like a very weak batch or like a crazy hot spot. And that's why the reaction for those strong doses can be so insane as opposed to just smoking weed. Wow, that's fascinating. That Cool. Can, I, can I have a follow-up question? Yeah, that? of course. So, so that makes me think. Um, so, if marijuana was one hundred percent recreational use legal on a federal level, do you think synthetic drugs like this would essentially evap evaporate um, off the streets? Would there be any need for these anymore? Um, I'm going to go with no, and I think one of the biggest reasons, um, and Ali can go into more depth on, on this, but I think one of the biggest things is that it's so cheap. I mean, in New York, a joint of K2 is a dollar, um, a joint is five to ten, like even in a legal market, it's, it's five to ten, as it was in Colorado. So I think price is a huge, huge factor um, that might keep synthetics here, even if we completely legalize marijuana. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I think you will see a decrease in some areas. There, A lot of people use uh, K2 and Spice that are on probation as a way to kind of avoid getting positive results on a drug test. So I think you would definitely see fewer people uh, using it overall, but I think the homeless population would still find it very appealing. Cool. That help? Yeah, yeah, totally. Thank cool. you. That's awesome. Yeah. 
All right. Well, hey, Brady, thanks for coming on, man. I um, hope we answered your questions um, as best we could. But anyway, um, we've got a bunch of people tweeting us things that I want you to take a look at, Neelu and Ellie. So Eggman wants to know, um, well, he said, Eggman. I know, <laughs> yeah, Eggman. Uh, Eggman Sounds says, legit. I know, it, uh, <laughs> yeah, K2 used to be legal in a lot of states. Is it illegal now or is it still legal? <laughs> Was K2 a government psyop to make people scared of weed legalization? Uh, so what's the uh, what's the answer? Was, is K2 I mean, still legal and was it a government psyop? I mean, well, firstly, as a noob, I don't necessar necessarily know what a government psyop is. So I'll just, <laughs> I'll, I'll lowball that to Allie. But I mean, right now it exists in this weird legal gray area where certain chemicals are banned, but because you know chemists change the compound so much that you can have a new compound that's being sold in a store that's not on the banned list. So they kind of exist in this weird gray area. Uh, first of all, is Eggman okay? Um, <laughs> I'm, not really Does he sure understood, yeah, I'm not really sure I understood the second part of that question, but um, what I think the answer is, is that uh, no, because if this is supposed to be something that's getting people afraid of impending marijuana legalization, it's probably failing pretty hard because if anything, this is just a lesson in what happens when you have prohibition on a drug. Um, you know, alternatives come up that end up putting you in the hospital, basically, is my take on it. All right, cool. So Eggman, I hope we got uh, a good answer for you there. And Good luck, uh, Eggman. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> so uh, normally this is where I would pull up another Skype guest, but we're having a little bit of technical difficulties with him. So let's look at another thing we got from Twitter, this time from Ronaldo. Um, and Ronaldo's question is, might seem kind of simple, but why would anyone smoke K2? Oh, Ronaldo, there are many, many reasons why someone would smoke K2. Um, it's really easy to get. They're sold at, it's sold at most corner stores, gas stations, and you, you know, I think the perception is that if it's sold that openly, um, it's, it's got to be safe for me, and that's completely false. Um, another reason, again, like we talked about before, it, it's super cheap, and Ali talked a little bit about this before as well, is it doesn't show up on drug tests if you are on probation. Is there anything I missed, Ali? I don't think so. I mean, the most recent study about whether young people were using this uh, came out in 2012, and it said like 11% of high school seniors had tried it. I think that that number would be much lower now with all the media reports of the things that could happen to you. Um, I think that primarily going forward, it's just going to be affecting the homeless population, and other populations will stop using it. Yeah, and people want to get high. People are always looking for a way to use drugs recreationally or not. Um, and this is just another another thing that's out there. So people are going to going to want to try it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, I hope we got that good for you, Ronaldo. Um, let's take a look at another tweet, actually. Uh, this one's from Uncle Chan. I uh, wish he could join us live today, but unfortunately, uh, our friend Uncle Chan's in school. But anyway, uh, Uncle Chan wants to know, uh, if the usage of K2 is more of a regional issue or if it's more tied to social class or gender uh, in the U.S. specifically? No, that's a really good question. I mean, in, when we filmed the story in, in New York, uh, in Brooklyn, we saw that it really was disproportionately affecting the homeless population in New York. And again, that goes um, back to the fact that it's so, so cheap and easy to get. Um, and but, but you are seeing reports of high school students using it and dying. I mean, there was a report last year of a student from Missouri who mixed K2 with codeine and alcohol, and he had a fatal OD. Um, and you do see that, but it's interesting. I mean, it is really impacting the homeless population here in New York, but for some reason, the only way that people start caring is when high school kids and, and younger kids start dying from it. Yeah, I think that's right, Nilu. Um, I think it's primarily a socioeconomic issue. Uh, it is absolutely ravaging the homeless population here in Brooklyn. And that's you know primarily a result of lack of social services and other things. Um, so I think Nilu totally hit the nail on the head with that. Cool. All right. So you know, without any further ado, let's go ahead and say hey to our next Skype guest. This is Nicole. Hi guys. How are you? Good. Hey, hey Nicole. Nicole. I'm more interested in the transit and trafficking of K2. I was wondering because uh, I'm in Central America and we're used to having a, a of being a transit zone, and we're used to having grown drugs, different than synthetic drugs, drugs pushed from South America to the states. In the case of K2, what have you seen that is the transit and trafficking of the drug? 
Right. So I, I personally haven't heard of a lot. I haven't necessarily heard of it being in, in the Latin American market. It could be there, but that's not something I've um, I've researched. But the way that it makes itself its way to North America is that these drugs are made in synthetic labs in China and India, definitely more um, predominantly in China. They're sold online as research chemicals, and that's how they kind of make their way here. Um, yeah, that's generally the trafficking route. Okay. Uh, following up, um, yeah, go, go. No, go ahead, Nicole, I'm sorry. Okay, um, following up on that, since uh, it's a very cheap drug, could you perceive that it's, like, like right now, the media attention has drawn back some of the users, but could you perceive that in countries with a lot less money, like Central America and North America, and even Mexico, do you perceive that it might move from the U.S. down the border? Um, I'm not too sure, you know, I mean, I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure if it's necessarily going to become like a huge thing in Mexico and Latin America. I don't, I don't really want to be a part of necessarily like media fear mongering about drug use at all. So yeah, I, I can't really answer that, but I can say that at times media coverage of drugs only helps to kind of create this aura around drugs that people actually end up using it more. Um, so sometimes media reports deters people, but sometimes it has the adverse effects of people starting to hear about these drugs and trying them. But please don't do K2. It is terrible. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I, I think as long as uh, these factories in Asia keep pumping it out and people want to keep getting high, this is going to be a problem. Um, it's hard to see it going away, although I do want to note that uh, in New Zealand, it's kind of the model for like how we should be dealing with this problem. In 2013, they kind of uh, realized people are going to want to get high, so we should try to regulate this. So they made people that want to produce the stuff get uh, expensive licenses uh, through the health department, and they kind of saw, I think it was like the number of outlets selling it reduced by 95%. So that's how they're dealing with it in that country. Um, I think that should be a model for how we deal with it elsewhere in the world. But let's go to the clip, sorry. No, I mean, I, I think that we, yeah, we should take a look at this clip where we see in uh, a K2OD in New York, and you can see what it looks like in an unregulated market. You got it? What'd you smoke tonight? Three bags. Three bags of what? Did you smoke K2 tonight? Yeah. So what's going on? How are you feeling right now? Open your eyes. Do you know where you are right now? That's my typical K2 patient. They usually go in and out. When I get, went in there, he's, he's not making any sense. He was responding to my voice, but not responding to my questions. We're seeing now the K2 patients, their blood pressures are dropping, and that's why, what's causing them to crash. It's getting bad because it's consistently happened now. It's not even a break in the day. Like, they're doing it all the time now. So I just wanted to kind of give a little bit of backstory and context of the clip we just saw. So we went out with a volunteer paramedics uh, team in Queens, and they respond to the psychiatric ward where they say they get up to five calls a night from people smoking K2. Um, and you know, just before we actually got the call to respond to this OD, um, we were interviewing the, para the EMT person. And while we were interviewing her, the same guy who's in the ambulance is just kind of walking in the background. And every time we say K2, this guy's giggling. And we're like, oh, is this guy smoking K2? He's smoking something. What's going on? And then like an hour later, we get a call to respond to his OD. So it's kind of strange to see those two link. Um, and I just want to throw to one more clip um, to a piece that Vice UK did about Spice and its population in the UK. I use it myself. Um, and I use it because it takes the pain away. You know, it's legal. What can I do? I can sit here now, there could be 20 officers around me with guns and everything. As long as I pull a bag of spice out and start rolling it, I can roll it. There's nothing that anybody can do. I pull a bag of weed out and they'll all be on me like a car bonnet. And how might people go about trying to get hold of it once you can't go into a shop and buy oh, it? There's always going to be some next level drug. There's already street dealers out there. But are you worried though that it might start criminalising people? Yes, yes. I've seen some bad... You, you, you've got to look at this drug, it's bringing... Heroin addicts. I know a heroin addict that's a spice head now that takes spice like he used to take heroin every single day of the week. But he doesn't touch the heroin now. So if that heroin at a class A drug is, and the spice is bringing him off that, what is in this stuff? It's amazing. So, yeah, it was a really well done piece by Vice UK and just showed how much uh, K2 and spice is impacting the homeless population there as well. So, yeah, it's terrible. Never do it ever. <laughs> 
just one I know question if I can. Yeah. Um, because so many of the people affected by K2 are homeless, do you have an, a, like an accurate number of how many people are dying from this drug? Like, not only like these cases that get a lot of media attention, but just like regular <clears throat> people, Joe Do uh, John Doe's? Yeah, I, I actually don't have a firm number on fatal ODs. Ali, did that come up at all in your reporting? Well, the thing is, it's really hard to figure that out because the fact is that the actual chemical composition of the drug shifts all the time. So that makes it really difficult to figure out in a toxicology report, uh, you know, what somebody was on and test for it specifically. So that's a really, really difficult uh, number to come up with. And I don't think anyone's actually come up with that number. Yeah. Yeah, and I was speaking to an emergency, an ER doctor in New York at a, at a hospital in Brooklyn. And he was saying that it's so difficult to treat people when they, when they come in for, um, for overdoses because they have no idea what was in it. So they say it's always touch and go, like, should we give this person an antipsychotic? Do we give something just to calm down their heart rate? And so every time they treat a K2 patient, it's different because every batch is different. Um, and it's just completely overwhelming the emergency services in New York particularly. Okay, girls, thank you so much for the information. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, Nicole, thank you so much for uh, Skyping in. So a couple more tweets uh, for you guys. Um, what, uh, actually, these I want you to address uh, because they're pretty similar. So what he wants to know, should legalization include synthetic weed? And would regulation make it better, uh, it being synthetic weed? Or should people just pursue good old marijuana? And uh, our friend Others uh, at Many Plants uh, wants to know, can the DAEA intervene? Can the, uh, these legal research chemicals be labeled as trafficking? So uh, two things. Should we be labeling these chemicals uh, illegally? Uh, should the DEA be doing that? And should legalization include synthetic marijuana? I mean, I'm going to sound pretty hippy-dippy, but I think that legalization <laughs> should include synthetic marijuana. I think that every drug should be, should be um, regulated so that we know exactly what's in it. And I think that when we look at New Zealand and how they've set the model for their um, regulation of synthetic drugs, it just shows that that's, that's where we should go. You're not, you can't really stop people from wanting to get high, but you can make it safer for them if they choose to. Yeah. yeah, I agree with that. And I feel like the only two routes that you can take, I mean, we've seen that it doesn't work to just ban the chemicals because then someone tweaks them and maybe they'll even be worse the second time and start causing people to have all these horrible health problems. So I think the only two possible things you can do are to uh, legalize and regulate them or to try to educate people. But in the case of these, these synthetic uh, drugs, oftentimes they affect people who might be impervious to this kind of just say no uh, rhetoric and people that have pre-existing mental health problems or substance abuse issues that don't really care that it's going to have such a, a bad effect on their health. So I feel like the only way that you can really combat it is by making it as safe as possible for people who want to use it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I don't think that the DEA would be able to really do much because it's it's sold online as a research chemical. And when it's being sold that way, it is it is legal for, for what it is. It's just illegal when people actually take it and use it for human consumption. So I don't think that the DEA would be doing anything productive by, you know, calling that trafficking. I think it would just lead to a whole new like epidemic of drug war issues that we're currently seeing happening right now. Cool. Well, I, I hope we answered your question, uh, Woody's, Woody and others. Um, Nilu, Ali, that's the uh, end of the show. So, Ali, uh, any last thoughts? Anything you want to send the people at home away with? Uh, don't do K2. That's about it. 420, blaze it. I don't, I don't have any last words. Well, you know, that's uh, as famous really a set of last yeah. words as we're going to get. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Ali. Nilu, yeah, uh, okay. see if you can top that. Um, I don't think I can. I guess all I can say is um, educate yourself and um, never do synthetic drugs ever. Um, but thank you for watching. And if you guys have any more questions, you can hit us up at Vice News and um, don't do K2. What's up, guys? How's it going? In this community, the majority of the K2 patients are unfortunately coming from uh, psychiatric patients. Yeah. I know a lot of people are trying to help them to understand that what they're doing is dangerous for them. Some of them are getting really hurt from it. But I've never seen so many people use one drug. A drug which is also attracting new users. U.S. drug officials warn increasing numbers of high school students admit to using K2. 
As for those already using it, it's so cheap and so easy to buy, they keep on coming back for more. <laughs>